Okay, good morning, everyone, and Hazak Baruch. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful Tuesday morning. Chodesh Tov, everybody, as we are entering the month of Sivan, a beautiful month, the month that the Torah was given to us. And of course, what better way to uh, get ready for this month than by studying Torah, as we have over here every single morning in our weekly, daily Pirasha class. So here we go. We open up a new book, a lot of new things going on, everybody. We have a new month, we have a new book, a book of Bamidbar. And we are, we are ready to go. The parasha begins, my friends, with the pasuk, Vaidaber Adonai el Moshe bemidbar Sinai. And Hashem speaks to Moshe in the desert of Sinai, Be'ohel Moed, in the, by the tent, by the meeting, uh, by the, by the Ohel Moed, the tent of meeting. Okay. What month are we in? Be'ehad, Lahodesh Hashini, the first of the second month, Bashana Hashini of the second year uh, when we left Misraim. So the Torah over here, we are told, is being given to Moshe Bemidbar Sinai. And there's a lot to say of you here, my friends. I'd like to share with you the Midrash. The Midrash comes and tells us something very, very interesting. The Midrash says that the Torah was actually given, when it was given to us, it's accompanied with three different things. Okay? The Torah was accompanied, and this is a Midrash found in Midrash Rabbah. The Torah was accompanied with fire, Be'esh. The Torah was accompanied with water, Be'mayim. And the Torah was accompanied with the wilderness, with the desert. And the Midrash goes on to prove this statement. The Torah was given with fire. Where do we see that? That's written in Shemot, chapter 19. The Pasuk says, Vehar Sinai Ashan Kulo. When God gave us the Torah in Har Sinai, it was filled with smoke. So there we have fire. The Torah as well was given with water. Where do we find that, my friends? So that's actually, to find that, you have to turn to the book of the prophets, the, the Shoftim, the judges. We know we had different judges. One of the judges was actually a female by the name of Devorah. And Devorah sings a song after uh, winning a very uh, important battle. And Shvatashar Devorah, and she goes on from the beginning of history and starts singing about in important historical points. And of course, the Torah is right here in the beginning. And she said, Hashem, Betetcha Seir, God, when you came forth from Seir. Now, when we hear Seir, we should know right away it's referring to Matan Torah. She says, God, when you came from Seir, when you advance from the country of Edom, Eretz Ra'asha, the earth trembled. Gam Shamaim Natafu, the heavens were dripping. Gam Avim Natfu Maim, the clouds were dripping with water. So you see that when the Torah was given, it was not only fire. She says here, she's a prophetess, so I'm going to take her word for it. Feel free to argue on her if you like, but uh, I won't. And she says that there was water. Gam avim nat fumayim. Okay. So Torah was given with fire. Torah was given with water. And the Torah was given with the desert. Where is that written? That one's easy. Search no further than under our noses in our parasha. Vadaber Adonai el Moshe bemidbar Sinai. Okay, beautiful. So here we have a fantastic midrash it's comparing the Torah, that the Torah was given with fire, the Torah was given with water, the Torah was given in the wilderness. And obviously each one of these teaches a very important aspect of how one must approach Torah, how we must study Torah. Fire represents warmth, heat, vigor, excitement. Always, if you ever see a fire, it's always jumping up and down, Right? Person has to always be growing. Person has to always be moving. Maybe that's why when they're learning, they're shuckling. You know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe. But uh, that is what the fire represents. When we teach Torah, it has to be given with warmth. We have to show how the Torah is beautiful. It has to be practiced with warmth. We have to keep it. Can't be, can't be cold. It has to be hot. We got to be on fire. Water, water. Also, we know says the Akut Eliezer has, um, you know, when you're thirsty, you drink it. But no one ever ODs on water, right? Did you ever, like, have a craving for water? 
No, you don't overindulge in water. When you're thirsty, you need it, you drink it. Once you're done, you have, once you're full, once you've quenched your thirst, no one says, I want more. No one wants more water. I want enough water. I need the amount of water that I need. No one wants to over, right? Indulge in water. So in life, we learn from the, we learn from the water that a person needs to realize that if I want to grow in life, if I want to grow spiritually, I need to be satisfied. I, can, I need to quench what I have. Like we learned in the past, لِيْسْتَبِكْ بَمُوَاتْ To be content. To be satisfied with what I have materially. Okay? I shouldn't... I should be like water when it comes to money. I should be like water. Right? What's money? I need enough... I need money to live. Once I drank my money, once I had enough money for today, that's it. What do I need more? I don't want to over drink. Right? So a person should make sure not to have... Not to over extend themselves financially. Okay? Finally, the desert. What does the desert represent, my friends? The desert is free. Do you have to pay to go to the desert? I don't know, maybe maybe some deserts today that are very, you know, historical, or I don't know what they have, you have to pay. Usually the desert is free, right? You don't have to pay taxes, you live in the desert, right? No one's charging you. Free to go to the wilderness? So the Torah was given in the, in the Midbar. What does that teach us? The Torah was given in the wilderness. That to succeed in Torah... A person has to, first of all, the Torah, we have to realize, it's free. Anyone and everyone has access to it. No one can claim a monopoly on Torah. No one can say, I, Torah is for me, and if you want it, you can only learn by me, and no other rabbi, no other books. My way is the only way. It's not true. Torah is accessible and for everyone, Okay. But also a person has to realize that to, to learn Torah, just like the desert is nothing. So a person has to realize that to be able to receive Torah, to be a keli, I have to make myself insignificant. Okay, and I need to permit all Jews to associate with me. If I'm arrogant, it's not going to work. Okay, so I think this is on a very simple level. What the Gemara is saying, okay? Well, what this Midrash, excuse me, is saying. Comparing the Torah to fire, to water, and to the desert. What's very interesting, if we can maybe just add one more layer of here, okay? Water, we know what, what's interesting about water. Water is very low. You ever saw water? Water always goes to the lowest place possible. Okay, whatever you, you could drop it on the top of a building, it's going to fall. You could drop it on the top of a mountain. It's going to make its way all the way down to the river. That's what water does. Water, humble. So to learn Torah, we need to be humble. Humility is a prerequisite for acquiring Torah. Why is that, by the way? Why do I need to be humble if I want to properly receive Torah? Our rabbis say, is it who hacham? How do you measure a wise man in Judaism? Are you wise? The one listening right now, you, whoever listening to this class, are you wise? Think to yourself, am I a wise person? Well, I like to think so. But how do I measure that? How do I measure wisdom? My IQ, 150. Do I measure it with my SAT scores, 1600? Do I measure it with how many employees I have? How do I measure knowledge, wisdom? Is it a chacham? Tell us our rabbis, Halomed Mikol Adam. You know what's a wise man? A wise man is someone that's able to open up their ears and listen to everyone. There's no one that I feel I can't learn from them. Even someone who's maybe younger than me. Even someone who's maybe, maybe not as smart as me, not as successful as me. He has something to say. I'm going to open up my ears. Let me hear it. I don't have to listen, but I can hear. A lot of times, a person, we have a little bit of arrogance. We say, no, uh, that, per, uh, that, that class, that rabbi, that uh, event is not for me. There's nothing for me. Uh, I've already been to that. I'm not going to find any singles there to marry. Not in there. In life, we have to be open. We have to be open to different ideas, to different uh, events, to different people, people that are maybe smaller than me. 
איזהו החכם הלומד מכל אדם. To be able to say, you know what, maybe there's wisdom here. Of course, again, sometimes there's danger to learning from everybody, right? Some, some people we're not allowed to learn from. If there's an apikores, if a person's a heretic, you, th you throw away even the Torah that he wrote. We have zero respect for such a Torah. Okay, so obviously not everything that uh, under the sun, there's always exceptions. But in general, in general, to be a chacham, I need to be humble. Because if I walk into a class, right, and I'm arrogant, so if the rabbi says something, or if the lecturer says something that I disagree to, because it's always going to be a part of a speech or something that maybe doesn't sit well with us. And by the way, if everything that any lecturer ever says always sits well with you, that's a problem. If nothing gets you a little bit, you know, heated up, why, why is everything that they're saying so okay for you? Why is it so easy for you to swallow? It doesn't bother you? So the, these values, you were born with them? Right? Obviously, if we're growing, that means it has to be painful. P growth, growing, they say growing pains, right? <laughs> That's not only physical, it's um, spiritual. That's in character. So if I'm always growing, it should be a little, and it should hurt me. The speech that the rabbi gives. If not, if it doesn't hurt, by the way, maybe the rabbi is not uh, talking to your level anymore. Maybe you already graduated. If you're sitting in the first grade class your whole life, obviously math is going to be easy. But because you're staying in first grade, maybe you got to move up to second grade. So maybe the books that we're reading, maybe the classes that we're listening to are too elementary. And it's time that I grow and move on to a more challenging, stimulating Maybe something is not on my level. Okay? So we have to also know that. But if a person sits in a class and says, oh, what am I going to learn from this guy? And what does he have to teach me? This guy, this clown, right? So that person, you hear something that the rabbi says that you don't like, you say, ah, I disagree with you, rabbi. I don't know about that. I want to get a second opinion. <laughs> Today in basketball, in sports, there's something called a challenge. You ever saw this one? It used to be the call was the call. Basketball, if it's a foul, it's a foul. Now, today, they have what's called a challenge. I could challenge the call. I get like one a game or two a game. I'm not sure on the rules exactly. But uh, you could challenge a call. The ref makes a call. I challenge. You ever saw this? Right? They go, I want to challenge it. I want to see the camera. Pull up the camera. Okay, nothing wrong. You could challenge a call. Problem is, sometimes we think we could challenge any and every call in life. Right? Some, life, some calls in life, we're not, we don't have the authority to challenge. All right? But a person needs humility. A person needs to be humble to say that. Of course, you could always ask. Let's say we shouldn't ask. We should always ask questions. If something bothers us, we should understand it. But sometimes in life, you're going to get to a point of stalemate. We're just not going to know. We're going to figure it out. And we're going to challenge the call. And then what do you do? What do you do when the rabbi, and then you go to, you know, you go to another rabbi maybe to get a second opinion, and the other rabbi agrees also. The person that's not humble says, ah, this halakha, I think the rabbis were off on this one. So we have to have the humility to be able to say, this is above me, this is beyond me. Naaseh v'nishma. What does that mean, my friends? Naaseh v'nishma means, I'm going to do it anyways. I understood it. I don't understand it. I'm going to do it anyways. Na'as Ebenishma. Okay? So this is what the, what the water represents. Water being, again, very low, very humble. Fire. What is fire? Fire, it gives light. The Pasuk says, Kiner mitzvah ve Torah or. The Torah is or. Or light. What does light do? When you're in the dark, when you don't know what to do, the fire... Shows you the way. You turn on a fire, you turn on a flashlight on your phone, right? And now you know where to go. You know what to do. This world, my friends, we have to realize, is very dark. Very scary. It's a big maze. Not always do we know how to get to the end. Right? Not always do we know how to get to the finish line. The Torah is what helps us get to the finish line. And again, going back to our earlier point, I want to share with you, a beautiful mashal that I made up myself, okay? 
As I was driving back yesterday on the highway, I take a lot of pride in this one. I was driving back, uh, heavy Memorial Day weekend traffic, and I'm sitting there in traffic. And it gives me an alternate route that's like a bit longer, but will save me time. Finally, as I merge onto the Garden State, it looks like it's going quickly, nice, fast. And there's two lanes in the Garden State. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this. There's the express lane and there's the local lane. And as I merge onto the local lane, I'm midway in the Garden State Expressway. And all of a sudden, there's a crossover into the express lane. Now, the lane that I'm in, the local lane, zooming fast. My Waze is telling me, go into the express. Okay, have this ever happened to you? This is one of life's biggest dilemmas. What do you do? Do you listen to the Waze or not? <laughs> Right now, I was thinking about it, and I, I said, "You know, it's such a such an interesting lesson over here. Here you are; your eyes are telling you the local, the local, the local is the right way. It's moving, express. It's bumper to bumper. Are you out of your mind? And all of a sudden, you look down, and the waist tells you, "No, go to the express." Who do you trust? What do you do? A conundrum. And I went with the ways. I went with the ways. And guess what? 15 minutes later, I was very happy that I went with the ways because I realized that the other side, it looked like it was moving, but just another, you know, half a mile, boom. Bumper to bumper to bumper. And then the express started moving. The third lane opened up and the ways was right. And again, this was such a big musad for me. Sometimes in life, we see success looks like it's from here. It looks like the way to go is that way. That's the faster lane. That's the right lane. This is what makes sense, the way I see it. But then you turn around and you have the Torah telling you, no, 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 go that way. And you're looking, what? How could it be? Go that way. I'm going to lose money if I close on Shabbat. I'm not going to have friends if I start keeping kosher. I'm not going to have a good marriage if I start keeping the laws of family of purity to stay away from my spouse for two weeks out of the month. That can't be the way to success. Impossible. I'm going to do what my mind and my eyes tell me makes sense. We have to remember the Torah comes from the word lehorot. What does lehorot mean? Lehorot means to guide. The Torah is guiding us. The Torah is a, it's a map. It, the Torah is our ways. And if we are smart, we will listen to it. Even though maybe it looks like the ways is off on this one. The ways, what are you doing, the ways? You're putting me in heavy traffic. You're sending me into the heat of the traffic. What are you doing? Let me stay over here in a nice lane. It's moving, it's fast. That's the trick of life. The trick of life is to remember that the Torah, like fire, it shows us the way. It's lehorot. It guides us. And when you're being guided, sometimes the satellite sees much more than you see. Sometimes the ways knows things ahead. Maybe it could be a mile or two or ten ahead that your eyes can't see, your mind can't comprehend. Our, our logic cannot really fathom all these things. The Torah can see, the Torah knows. So to person to remember that the Torah is like a fire, the Torah is a guidebook. When we follow it, how many laws in the Torah we realize many, 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 many years later are brilliant. Actually, when people study the laws of family purity, and again, at first glance, it looks like it's very hard to keep. How am I going to keep this? Separate from my spouse every month? This is out of your mind. It's going to just break my marriage. As it is, my marriage is on the rocks. Now you want me to do this? But the truth is, even therapists and experts realize how important it is sometimes in life to take a break. How important it is to be able to have something that's off limits. And my spouse is off limits. They realize that the laws of kosher teach us to curb and to control our desire and our appetite. The laws, all the laws of the Torah, lehorot. They are the Torah, lehorot. Everyone repeat after me. Lehorot.
to guide. The Torah is a guidebook. And if you're smart, you take it with you. And whatever it says, I got to follow it. I know it doesn't look like it's right. I know it looks wrong. My eyes see this lane is the faster one. Torah is telling me to go to that lane. Crossover. All right. All right. This is the leap of faith. So this is number two. To, that the Torah is like a fire. And number three, the desert. What does the desert represent? The desert represents, again, the minimal. There's nothing in the desert. Sometimes in life, if we want to grow spiritually, we have to be able to be content with minimal. The famous story that we just saw in Masechet Shabbat, page 33, where Rabbi Bishim on Bar Yochai went with his son in the cave for 12 years and then another year, 13 years. And what do they eat? They had carobs. And what do they drink? They drink water. And when they came out of the cave, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was on another level of genius. He was much greater than when he went in. And his son-in-law, after his son-in-law came to greet him, and he took him to the bathhouse, and he saw all the cracks on his skin, and he started crying, and he says, I'm sorry, father-in-law, to see you like this. And Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says, no, 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 no. You should be happy that you saw me like this, because this is the only reason that I have this now. And so sometimes in life we have to make sacrifices. We want to grow in certain areas. It's going to come at a cost. You want, to have a, you want to have a nice hamburger or do you want to lose weight? Do you want to, you, want to, you know, have fun? Or do you want to maybe practice uh, for the marathon? You have a goal. Sometimes goals in life require sacrifice. I would love to, uh, I would love to go to the beach. But I, got, um, I have an important business meeting I have to prepare for. So to be like a desert, if we want Torah as well, it's no exception. Torah requires sacrifice. Sometimes we have to be willing to study even if it's difficult. Maybe the AC is not working so well in the synagogue today, but I'll sit in the class anyways. Maybe the, you know, maybe the food is not so good where I'm going away, but okay, at least I know there's going to be kosher, there's going to be minyan, whatever, again, whatever the situation may be, my friends, to be able to make a sacrifice for the Torah, be able to be with the minimum, so up till now, we spoke about how the Torah compares to fire, how the Torah compares to water, and how the Torah compares to a desert. Water. Okay, fine. <laughs> fine. So here we go. And now, my friends, I'd like to take it to the next level. Because the truth is, the Midrash doesn't end there. The Torah doesn't just compare him to fire, water, and desert. Torah then goes on to say, the Midrash, excuse me, then goes on to say, Why was the Torah given with these three? Just like says the Midrash, fire, Torah, uh, sorry, fire, water, and the desert are all free. So to the Torah is free. Like it says in Isaiah chapter 55, Whoever is thirsty, go drink water. If you're thirsty, go drink water. And the end Maim Ella Torah. If you're thirsty, go drink Torah. And this needs to be understood on many levels. What does it mean? Whoever is thirsty, Go drink water. Again, we just compared the Torah to three things. Fire, water, desert. And then the Midrash ends off only comparing it to one. Whoever wants Torah, go drink it like you drink water. Wait, time out. One second. You just compared it also to fire and desert. Why would you leave out those two? Why would you only conclude with the water, Pasuk? Hoi kol tzameh Also, the word hoi... Hoi sounds like a little bit like a, like a whale. Like, oi vavoi. Woe unto me. Hoi. What's the sadness of you here that this person is going to drink Torah like water? It sounds like it's a sad thing. It sounds like it's an unfortunate thing. Okay? It sounds like, no, but again, answer the question. It sounds like it's unfortunate. 
And so over here, the Lake Atov quotes a beautiful idea from Rav Falaham. I don't know how to pronounce it. But uh, he has a he has a commentary on the Magid Meduvna's book, the Ohel Yaakov. Rabbi Yaakov of Duvna. He, uh, he was known for his parables. And Rav Falaham over here explains something very, very powerful. He says, we all know that we have different traits. Yes, we have traits. And our traits, often, we have polar opposite traits. As an example, sometimes a person has arrogance and a person has humility. People, have, people are merciful and we have cruelty. We have love and we have hate. And really to succeed in life, man has to know not, not which trait to use and which trait to discard, but when to use each of those traits. Okay, meaning it's not that merciful is good and cruelty is bad. No, merciful has a time and cruelty has a time. And we've spoken about this in the past, the balance. To be merciful is good when I'm dealing with uh, good people. To be cruel is also good. When is it good to be cruel? When I'm dealing with evil people. If there's someone that's evil, if there's someone that's, that's trying to destroy, I have to be very cruel to them. I shouldn't be nice to that person. If there's a terrorist, I'll give you an example. God forbid if there's a terrorist or a shooter, I'm not supposed to be merciful, let him go, let me think about it, let me try to talk to the guy with evil. You got to go head on, you got to kill him, you got to be cruel in a way, okay? Whoever's, whoever's merciful to cruel people eventually will be cruel to kind people. That's, that's something that we have to know, okay? So every midah, I need to know when. I'll give you another example. To be uh, humble. Humble is nice, no? But take a look at the first king of Israel, Shaul HaMelech. He lost the Malchut because he was too humble. His humility, he took it too much. He was humble and that's why he was picked to be a king. Live by the sword, die by the sword. Shaul HaMelech was picked because he was humble and he lost it because he was humble. How could that be? Could be because humility needs to be used at the right time and place. And Shaul HaMelech overdid his humility. So as an example, when Shaul, when Shlomon, when Shmuel HaNavi anointed him, and people started ridiculing him, Shaul didn't say anything. Can't let that go, you're the king. You gotta put your foot down. You gotta know when to be humble, when not to be humble. When, when Shmuel gave him an order to kill Amalek, Shaul went out and he killed almost all of Amalek. He kept the sheep alive because the people put pressure. Dude, you're the king. Forget pressure. You got to put your foot down. Shaul, again, too humble is also no good. So a person always has to know when to use humility, when to use arrogance, when to be merciful, when to be cruel. Love and hate also. Person needs to know when to hate certain things. I have to hate evil. If there's someone that's evil for me, if there's a bad influence on me, I shouldn't show love. I have to hate that. Okay, so we need to know when to apply. Also, there are there's another trait that's one and the opposite, and that is the midav teshuka. Teshuka is to yearn. And the opposite, what's the opposite of yearning? Anyone know what's the opposite of yearning? To be satisfied, to be content, right? We, we just spoke about that in the beginning of today's class. Histapkut, lehistapek, bamuat. To be happy with what I have, but also to yearn. And both of these also are very important. So that means sometimes I need to yearn. Sometimes I should be happy with what I have. When? When it comes to physicality, I should always be looking to be happy with what I have. For physicality, it's enough. He's tapek. Sp spirituality, to yearn for more. For spirituality, I should be always, I should have a desire. That's why, by the way, we just, we quoted in, in the past, the pasuk. Bashamayim ba'aretz mitachat. 
we, we said on a drashic level that when it comes to Bashamai, when it comes to spirituality, when it comes to the heavens, Mima'al, we should always look up. We should always want to have more. When it comes to Ba'aretz, when it comes to uh, earth and physicality, Mitahat, we should look down. We should be content. The person must always know that for money, for physicality, to be happy with what I have. That's why the Pasuk says when it comes to the Torah, im, right? Uh, what does that mean? If you will search for it like you search for money. Why did Hashem create that search that we all have? That drive. Right now, I have a lot of money in the bank. But I'm still going to try to make more. I'm going to try to invest. Why? Why do I have that drive? You know why Hashem gave that drive to you? That drive was so that you could take it and use it for Torah. To take it and do chesed. To take it and to help other people. That's why that drive was given. So if, one in if a person in life has a feeling of that burning desire, if you feel that drive for temptation, if you feel that fire, what is fire? Fire represents to do. I say, to go out, to conquer. That's the fire. The fire in me is the passion in me. If a person feels that passion, sometimes that passion is for the wrong things. Sometimes I'm supposed to have passion for Torah, but all of a sudden I have a passion maybe for a person, or I have passion for food, or I have passion for money, and maybe it's not the best thing. So a person needs to then take fire. What puts out fire? What puts out fire? You put out fire with water. So a person needs to apply the water, which is cold, to cool down, to put out that temptation. So you see that fire and water are also opposites. The Torah was compared to fire. The Torah was compared to water. Sometimes I need to apply this. Sometimes I need to apply that. And this is not, this is a nice level. This is what we call a person that's Moshel Be'yitzro. This is what a person who conquered his, conquers his yetzer, his evil inclination. Because when I am being told by my yetzer to do this, I'm conquering it and I'm doing that. That's a beautiful level. But my friends, what does the pasuk have to say about this person? This person that has to go to water. Whoever is thirsty, go and get water. If you feel the temptation taking control of you, Put it out with water. That's nice level. But the, the Navi is wailing and says it's a shame. What's the shame? The shame is that this person even has the desire to begin with. The fact that you're on the level that you already are thinking about those things. There's a higher level you should know. You know what the higher level is? The person is not even interested. He doesn't even need the water to put out the fire. He doesn't have the fire at all. And this is the third element. This is the desert. When the Torah is like a desert, that means, that I, what's a desert? Nothing. Desert, empty. When a person is not even wanting these things in life, right? You know, often we speak about jealousy. What's jealousy? I'm jealous of you. I'm jealous of your car. I'm jealous of your house. I'm jealous of your vacations that you just went on. I'm jealous of why you get those things and not me. I'm jealous of your, your partner. I'm jealous of the clothing you wear, of the events you go to, of the parties you have. Right? Jealousy. And what happens when we're jealous? We often speak about, I should remind myself that I have this and I have that. But the truth is, the truth is, even without, even without reminding it ourselves, a person should ask, why am I even jealous? The Torah doesn't say, if you're jealous, calm yourself down. The Torah says, don't even get jealous. But you may ask, how is that possible? Jealousy is a feeling. It's an instinct. I am jealous. I felt jealous. I saw someone, I got jealous because of them. How can he tell me not, not to even get jealous? How can he tell me to control my, my feelings? I understand if you tell me, don't hit the guy that you're jealous of. Okay, I'll control my hands. If you're jealous of somebody, don't punch them in the face. Don't steal from them. Don't slander them. Don't badmouth people. I got it. 
I'm not going to talk. I could control my mouth. But now you're telling me I shouldn't have even gotten jealous to begin with. How is that possible? How is that possible? I am. I'm jealous. I won't do anything about it. I won't act on my jealousy. But I am jealous. And the answer says it by Bernstein something beautiful. The problem is, why is your value system such that the nicer car gets you jealous? That's the problem. The problem is that you're valuing too much money. You're valuing things too much. Your value system is why you're jealous. You think he's jealous of a guy's car? He's not because he doesn't value a car. You're only jealous of things that you value in life. When the Torah says, don't, don't be jealous, it means, don't envy, it means, build for yourself a value system that those things are no longer important, that they should even matter to you. A couple in Bnei Brak, I believe we may have said this story in the past, they had a uh, dispute. The husband started off the marriage learning. Eventually he had to start going out to work. And Baruch Hashem, business started getting successful. He was able to start affording, you know, nicer things and better things and better quality. And at one point they decided on maybe when it came time to, to lease a new car, the husband was contemplating leasing a uh, BMW. He wanted to get a BMW. He was able to afford it. And the wife said, listen, you know, you're going to get a BMW, you live in B'nai Brak, you're going to create jealousy. Everyone's going to look at you and they're going to see you're the only guy in town with anything nicer than a Honda, you know? <laughs> and uh, maybe it's not the best thing to arouse the jealousy in other people. They went back and forth, but listen, Hashem blessed us, we should use the money. What's the problem? I have to now think about other people and creating jealousy for others. And the wife said, yeah, but it doesn't matter. You should have put it in their face. Ba, 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 ba. Let's go to Rav Chaim Kanievsky. They went to Rav Chaim Kanievsky. And he said, listen, you know, Rabbi, I started off in Kolel and, you know, it was getting very tight. I had to start working. And, you know, so, you know, thank God I, I, I have money and I wanted to buy a BMW. My wife's worried about jealousy. What do you think, Rabbi? And Rav Chaim, he said, oh, it's interesting. He went back and forth and he said, he's waiting. And he finally turns to the husband. He says, tell me, do you, um, you, uh, you learn? You, you're learning every day, Kovei Ayatim? He says, listen, I'll be honest, Rabbi. Ever since, um, ever since I had to start working, I couldn't, I couldn't be in Kolil anymore. I had to leave the Kolil. So uh, unfortunately to learn, you know, uh, the first Seder till 1 p.m. was just undoable with the job that I have. I have to be at the office at 10. So Rav Chaim said, oh, okay. Um, well, do you, learn, do you learn every day for an hour? He says, listen, you know, I, I try, uh, but, uh, you know, it's just very, the, the work is very committing and obligating. And to learn for an hour every day is, is a bit tough. I come home, I'm tired. I unwind, I spend time with the kids. Chaim said, aha, uh -huh, um, you learn on Shabbat? He says, you know, I, uh, I go to the class, you know, maybe if I have time before Minha, I try to catch, you know, the end of the class. But... So Rav Chaim says, uh -huh, okay, well, anyways, uh, about your question, I think you could get the, uh, the BMW if you like. I was shocked. Rav Chaim, to say I get the BMW, he's like, I don't understand, Rabbi. A minute ago, you were not sure. All of a sudden, I mean, what about the jealousy? Rav Chaim looks at the guy. He says, what jealousy? Who's going to be jealous of you? You don't learn Torah at all. Why would anyone be jealous of your car? You understand? This is the value system that Rav Chaim Kanievsky had. Car? Jealous of a piece of metal and four wheels? What am I valuing in my life? Why is my head even jealous of that? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. Before going to the rabbi and saying, Rabbi, I need to sit with you. Why is Hashem doing bad things to me? Why don't I have a nice car? Why can't I afford a nice vacation? Why can't I afford a big house? We have to first ask ourselves, why are those things important to me? 
Why is that giving me grief every single day? Why is it causing me stress? I have such an amazing life. Why am I stressed over a piece of metal? Why am I bugging out about some green paper bills? Why is that my value system? That's the issue. If you have fire, if you have a passion for money or for physical things, then you got to put it out with water. And that's nice. It's good that you put it out with water. It's nice that you're able to calm the situation down, to neutralize, to, to make it okay. You're able to cool the situation, calm it down. Good, good, good for you. Water did it. Hazaku Baruch. You, you put out the fire with water. But hoy, it's a shame that you even had that problem to begin with. Why? Ask yourself, why is there even a temptation? What am I doing that's leading to the temptation? What, what values do I have that I'm even envying such things? The issue starts way before the fire. And that's what the desert is, my friend. The desert, the midbar, we need to first work on the steps before the issues begin. A lot of times we're going through things, it could be in a marriage, it could be in a relationship, it could be at work. And often we get stuck on trying to figure out how to solve this problem. We forget that this problem is just a symptom. The problem started here. We have to really figure out much, much, there's much, many things way before that have to be figured out. Okay, and this is, this is the wailing of the Navi. This is the, the sighing that he has. Okay, I guess if, you, if, if fire is in your heart, then put it out with water. But you need to know that there's a stage way before the fire that, that's the issue. This is the desert. When a person creates in themselves a desert, when a person studies the Torah, when a person creates the correct system, when we follow the Lehorot, the guiding light that the Torah is, then we will be able to realize that we have everything that we need, that the lives that we have, the things that we thought were issues, not really issues. The problems were not really problems. And then we won't even, we won't even be thirsty for water. We think we're thirsty because we think the cup is half full because the problem is, my friends, you're using a big cup. But if you, remi- if you take a smaller cup, then your cup isn't half full or half empty. Your cup is full to the top. So working on getting the right cups, working on, re- on getting the right system, the right values, the right skills, the- getting the right hashkafa, the right approach, the right philosophy in life, and then everything Bezat Hashem will fall into place. Okay, I think we said enough for today. Stop over here. God willing, we'll see you all uh, tomorrow. Bye-bye.